this is pretty interesting. What's that? Well, I was looking through some of the footage that we gathered, and I had a thought. Oh, really? Congratulations. No, seriously. Do you remember the idea of pressure height? That there's a certain point of elevation that you can reach where it's just not feasible to take the blimp any higher. Yeah, the higher a blimp rises into the air, the more helium expands inside the blimp. Yeah, it's an effect of air pressure. And pilots keep the air pressure inside of the blimp balanced by using ballonets, those bags of air inside the envelope. When the ballonets are completely empty and the envelope is filled to capacity with helium, the blimp just can't go any higher. Yeah, that's right. There's basically a limit to how high a blimp can go, and it's called pressure height. So what was your thought? Well, I was wondering if pressure height prevents the blimp from getting to certain places. You know, I was wondering if mountain ranges reach taller than that limit, the pressure height. I don't follow you. Check this out. Let's just say you're in a blimp flying over Chicago, and you want to go to, let's just say, Los Angeles. Okay, sounds fun. So the maximum operating altitude of the blimp is well under 10,000 feet. So if you look at this map, the Rocky Mountains are pretty high. The blimp just wouldn't be able to easily fly through the mountains. So you wouldn't be able to go straight from Chicago to Los Angeles because of pressure height. You'd have to go around the mountains somehow. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was pretty interesting, though. Mm-hmm. Actually, that gives me an idea. What's that? I wonder who decides where the blimp flies. If I remember correctly, I think there's a ground crew that travels with the blimp. Yeah, there's a crew of buses and trucks that drive on the road in front of the blimp. Do you think they're the ones that decide where the blimp goes? You got me, but I'm sure they know a little bit about maps and navigation, which I suppose is what we're talking about. Well, we obviously have to talk to somebody who's with the blimp. I'll see if I can set up an interview for this afternoon. Chances are, you've probably seen the Goodyear blimp at least once in your life, either on TV or maybe even flying over your hometown. The blimp sure isn't easy to miss. But what is easy to miss is the ground crew. Who's that, you ask? Every time the blimp takes flight, there's a crew of people who take the same trip by bus or truck. It may be a less glamorous role, but the ground crew plays an essential part in the flight of the blimp. We're here today at Goodyear's Wingfoot Lake Airship Base in Suffield, Ohio, to talk with Captain Hissom and Assistant Crew Chief Schenkel about the ground crew for the spirit of Goodyear. So, Captain Hissom, how do mountains affect where the blimp goes? When we cross mountains, we usually look at our maps and we go for the, uh, the lowest part of the mountains. But it also has to do with pressure height, and that's the concept where the ballonets are flat and the total envelope is filled with helium, and the helium can only expand so much until we start losing it, so we like to uh, stay below that pressure height. But we look for a lowest, the lowest part of the mountain. Where do you find the information to plot a course? We use maps obtained from the government. They're called aeronautical charts, and some of the information it includes on them is uh, topographical information, elevations, airport information, and also includes frequencies that we need along our route. How do pilots know where they're going? Well, we use uh, a combination of the aeronautical charts I just described, and we also use a GPS, which is a global positioning system, and we have two of those on board. We have what's called a directional gyro that spins gy gyroscopically, and if that should fail, a backup compass is your only backup because it's magnetic and it doesn't need anything else to power it. So basically, we use that DG, that the compass, to set that DG, which is a directional gyro. How do blimp pilots know where they are? When we're in good weather, we use a concept called pilotage, and that is where you look at your map and you look out the window at the ground to see what you're by, and you can, you can tell where you are by, say, intersections of roads, uh, relation of a lake to a city, stuff like that, and we also can use a compass to set our direction or our course. Okay. How do you determine how much fuel you need for a flight? We can do that by realizing what the winds are aloft, so how the wind is going to affect the blimp and how long we're going to be aloft, and we base our fuel load on that, and we like to take a little extra fuel just in case we should run into some good headwinds. Are there parts of the country where you can't fly? Yes, there are. There's some places out west that have too high of an elevation, 
And as we talked about pressure height, it would just be too high for the blimp to have enough lift to fly in. Okay, can you fly to the North Pole? We could fly to the North Pole because elevation wouldn't be a factor, but one factor that might inhibit us from going to the North Pole would be weather. Now you're the assistant crew chief. How do you coordinate the ground crew with the blimp? Well, we try to plan out with the airship uh, the route that we're going to take each day. And then we have to stay in radio contact with them throughout the day. We check in about once an hour, stuff like that. That way to make sure they're not having any problems or would have to turn around because of weather, uh, find an airport to go to to set up the morning mess to get them on the ground, as well as let them know that our traffic is running smooth and uh, we're on schedule to be making it to the destination where we're supposed to go. What does the ground crew do exactly? Well, without, without us, uh, they have a hard time landing. The airship is so big, uh, the nose always has to land into the wind. So basically, when the airship is off the mooring mast, we are the mooring mast for it. Uh, we grab the lines, and we pull the nose around to keep it in the wind at all times. Uh, as well as we set up the mooring mast, we pull the watches on it every night. Somebody's always with it 24 hours a day. Pressure height limits where the blimp can go. For instance, pressure height prevents the blimp from passing through certain areas in the west. There are just some places where the elevation is too high. Because the blimp has height limitations, blimp pilots use maps and other tools to find their way from one place to the next. And the ground crew, too. Using maps and navigational aids has always been important for lighter-than-air pilots. You have to know where you are going because you'll need to meet people on the ground in order to land. And knowing where you are and where you're going is really important when you fly long distances. For instance, in 1926 an Italian airship flew from Rome to the North Pole. It was the first crossing of the Polar Sea by air and the dirigible had to be able to find a ship anchored near the polar ice cap in order to take on enough supplies to get home again. One of the strengths of dirigibles is the fact that they can stay aloft for so long. A German passenger airship, the Graf Zeppelin, made the first round-the-world flight in 1929. It logged 300 hours in the air over a period of three weeks to complete the 21,000-mile flight. They shipped supplies to bases all around the world and then had to navigate the airship to those bases in order to land and resupply. During World War II, Navy blimps patrolled off the east and west coasts of the United States. They had to fly out several hundred miles and then find their way back to their bases. They also flew near ship convoys looking down to spot submarines. Out of sight of land and the ships, the crew had to know how to navigate or face the possibility of crashing into the sea. In 1957, a Navy blimp navigated from Florida to Europe, then to Africa, then back across the Atlantic Ocean to Florida. It flew a record setting 8,216 miles and still holds the record for sustained, unrefueled flight by any type of aircraft. It stayed aloft for 264 hours. That's 11 days. Mm -hmm. 